those symbols have to be followed through all their implications before they open out the full system of correspondences through which they represent, by analogy, the millennial adventure of the soul. And I like this quote because what we have here is a nice, concise statement of the hero with the thousand faces itself and what Campbell is doing. He's going through and he's taking all of these myths from all over the world and sort of smelting them down to pull out a single archetype. And the archetype that he pulls out, the hero's journey, turns out to be the millennial adventure of the soul. Life itself is a journey. The moment that we're born, we come out of the mother womb into the phenomenal world of space-time. And uh, we find an adventure waiting for us, whether we're willing to undertake it or not. But uh, the adventure is there, and almost any aspect of life can be looked at in terms of this sort of hero's journey motif. This, uh, Campbell writes it out as this threefold uh, separation, initiation, and return. And he sort of arbitrarily assigns it these three algebraic terms, x, y, z. And this turns out to be, and then he puts a circle through it, and a threshold. It's a little bit like the model that we had of Jung's model of the psyche, where, if we recall, in that case we had the, uh, the little box of the ego, and the self was at the center, and the line was off-center, indicating that the uh, ego normally is off-center in its thinking, and myths connect the ego back to the sources of inspiration, the wellsprings of inspiration for our life. You, know, you don't know how you're going to solve a problem or what you're going to do. The intellect doesn't know. But if you go and do something else or take a vacation or something, uh, the self, meanwhile, sets itself to work and then begins springing up uh, intuitions. The chemist uh, Kekulé, uh, who discovered the structure of the, of the uh, benzene ring, which is uh, lays out, actually, uh, in a sort of circular structure like this, and from out of that formula came the whole of the industry of organic as well as inorganic chemistry. That came to him from a mythological vision. Uh, he was trying to figure out what the structure of this uh, benzene uh, ring looked like, and he had a vision of the serpent biting its tail, the old vision from alchemy. And uh, that came to him when he was in a state, I think he was riding on the top of a bus uh, from home from work or something, and it just came to him. And it solved that. Uh, chemical problem and from out of that came uh, everything from plastics to uh, all the chemicals and toxins with which we're poisoning ourselves today. And um, so myths really do, uh, they, they do uh, just sort of uh, sketch themselves out in this kind of hieroglyphic language that we didn't have to unpack with words and uh, you can, uh, the great filmmaker David Cronenberg, I don't know if anybody's seen any of his films, uh, Videodrome, Dead Ringers, uh, Existence, and uh, Crash. He was once uh, making a film with uh, Jeremy Irons and they were filming uh, Dead Ringers, which is about these twin gynecologists. And that film is actually based on a true story of these twin gynecologists in New York who yeah. were found dead in their posh Manhattan apartment. Drug they had committed stuff. mutual suicide and it turned out that there was this horrendous story that they were sleeping with all these patients and abusing all these drugs. So Cronenberg took the sort of real life version of that and filtered it through the language of his uh, uh, visionary style. And uh, he cast Jeremy Irons in both roles. Uh, he does a fantastic job. I mean, that film put Jeremy Irons, uh, put Jeremy Irons on, yeah. Jeremy oh, Irons on the, on the map. And uh, after that, he got all these great roles. And he said, you know, you want, they were talking about discussing doing a dream sequence. And the dream sequence had something to do with Jeremy Irons waking up. And um, uh, there was a sort of smaller version of the other twin sort of in this emaciated state sort of talking to him almost like the image of Brahma coming up out of the navel of Vishnu a little bit like that and Jeremy Irons uh, you know he's a British gentleman doesn't want to get too dirty and he said is there really any necessity for this scene and Jeremy Irons said well if we don't shoot this scene I'll have to write 10 pages of dialogue to get those implications across so what can be gotten across in one vivid snapshot uh, that can be understood on all these levels sort of simultaneously at once uh, cannot be understood unless you just sit here and unpack it. It's like the dialogue between the right brain and the left brain. The right brain gets it with images, but the left brain has to slowly uh, dice it out in this linear language. So uh, anyhow, that's the sort of uh, introduction to our talk tonight. And uh, what I want to do is just spend a few minutes looking at the career of Joseph Campbell, uh, some of his writings, and then uh, about 8 o'clock go right into uh, the hero itself. Uh, Campbell's career, actually, uh, there are four major works that uh, sum up his entire uh, opus. And the first one is uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which was 
published in uh, 1949. And then the next major opus is this thing called The Masks of God, and that's in four volumes itself. And those volumes came out from uh, 1959 down to about 1968. Uh, primitive mythology in which he covers uh, the aboriginal uh, myths of the world. And then that was followed by oriental mythology in which he dealt with China and India, and briefly Japan and Tibet. And then that was followed by Occidental mythology in which he went into the, uh, the biblical world and the world of the Greeks and the Persians. And then finally in 1968 with creative mythology which is based on the, uh, sort of the northern European mythological complex which uh, if you start it with the grail romances and then come forward into the 20th century, uh, Campbell as far as he is concerned, that constitutes a single mythological tradition, namely intensely creative. We in the West have specialized in departing from tradition, and it is our great poets and artists rather than our priests who have given us the mythological intuitions, everyone from Blake and Dante to James Joyce and uh, Thomas Mann. So uh, this, these are his two greatest works. Uh, we have these two minor works, The Mythic Image, which was published in 1974. And this was, uh, he actually, the first volume of the, the entire Bullingen series is this little thing here where the two came to their father, which is just his gloss on a Native American myth. And that was the first of the whole series of uh, Bullingen volumes, and the mythic image was the last one. It's labeled volume 100. And uh, it's an immense survey. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it's this huge book packed with mythological images, and it illustrates his thesis that myths are pictorial and uh, not linguistic, and language uh, never uh, fully unpacks what, uh, what is implicit within them. And then the final work that uh, he finished off his career with, but um, it still remains unfinished, he died about halfway through it, or even a quarter of the way through it, is the historical atlas of world mythology. And the first volume here appeared in 1983, and he died in 87, and the final uh, part that he had finished was published in 19, uh, actually later in 87, I believe, volume one and two. And uh, this is largely a rewrite of the Masks of God insofar as it is a vast historical survey of the, the history of mythology, except that unlike the Masks of God, uh, it has all the imagery of the mythic image. So it's a kind of fusion of these two and uh, it, it is left unfinished. It was also like Masks of God to have been in four distinct parts and um, was left unfinished. So th those are the four major works. Did you work a lot on? Uh, uh, my original introduction to the Campbell Foundation was that I heard uh, there were still notes and so forth left of the historical atlas that uh, were going to be finished and put together in a kind of uh, posthumous works and I wrote a letter to them asking if they needed any help on writing footnotes and so forth. And that was my initial introduction to them. And they wrote back and said, uh, <coughs> and they wrote back and said, uh, yeah, if you're interested, uh, we're publishing his diaries from his travels uh, in India. And the travels in India actually take place uh, between the hero and the masks of God in 1954 and in 55. And that actually, as you read those diaries, they turn out to be the precipitating cause for the writing of the masks of God because the hero with a thousand faces is an entirely Jungian endeavor, and it is meant to show us that sort of, you know, the monomyth, all myths are one myth and can be boiled down to this single archetypal separation, initiation, return. It's a very Jungian undertaking. But then with the masks of God, he goes through with the historical transformations, and he shows you actually the different cultures have enormous differences between them. And you can take some of these ideas, like the idea of the hero or the idea of the soul, and compare them in different cultures, and they don't match up very well at all. I mean, the differences are enormous. So you can emphasize uh, the perennial philosophy, as it were, that all the great world traditions are saying essentially the same thing, and you can amass enough evidence to demonstrate that, or you can go through, as some scholars tend to prefer to do, and say, well, no, uh, what Judaism is saying is one thing, but uh, you won't find that in Hinduism, and so forth. So, and what precipitated this was his journey to India in 1954-55, he had been editing all these volumes of Heinrich Zimmer's posthumous writings, and uh, he himself had started his career in the late 30s, editing uh, and writing footnotes for the Upanishads, uh, and Swami Nikilananda's translations of the Upanishads and the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. So he was absorbed for at least 12 to 15 years.